Okay, okay. Is Airbnb dead? Uh, not entirely. But essentially, Las Vegas politicians have assaulted, maimed, and paralyzed short-term rentals and put them into a vegetative state that no one's waking up from. So think of Las Vegas as the proverbial canary in the coal mine. Perhaps a cautionary tale of how corporate donors and career politicians colluded together to arguably skirt the U.S. Constitution and enact arguably an illegal bill that's now being challenged in the Nevada Supreme Court. This is the story of how Las Vegas managed to kill short-term rentals. Now, much like many of you watching, one of my personal dreams was to have a second home, preferably near a beach instead of this desert I live in. But since I don't have the personal time to fully enjoy it right now, I planned on monetizing the property by renting it on short-term intervals. Now, my biggest fear all along was exactly what Las Vegas just did recently, which is effectively kill the entire industry. While this has crushed many investors, the effect this could have on other small communities could be much more profound. So today, we're going to explore who was behind this, where the true motivation came from, and explore the current legal battle unfolding in the Nevada Supreme Court. All right, look, it's no surprise to anyone the resort and hotel industry is what made Vegas and currently dominates the financial landscape here. Now, while the mob no longer runs Vegas per se, like a good mobster, when someone comes along and tries to take your piece of the pie, what do you do? You 86 them, right? Eight miles out of town and six feet deep, as the saying goes. Well, in 2018, the Clark County commissioners essentially imposed a ban on all short-term rentals here in unincorporated Clark County. So just think the Las Vegas Strip area. Meanwhile, the city of Las Vegas and its surrounding cities came up with their own restrictions, such as requiring licensing and even going so far as to require the properties to be owner-occupied with only their bedrooms to rent. Basically, it kept it legal, but it was so restrictive that you know no one even bothered. So depending on who you asked, we had between 10,000 to 13,000 short-term rentals operating. While a few homeowners managed to get their own licenses and operate legally, I'd say 95% simply continued to operate illegally. Now, every now and then you'd hear these anecdotal stories about investors being fined, but the truth was that there was effectively no enforcement. So carry the hell on, as Kendrick Perkins would say. Now, according to Airbnb alone, had Las Vegas streamlined and legalized short-term rentals properly, they would have collected $14.5 million in resort or hotel room fees just in 2019 alone. Some other estimates were $45 million. Now, here's where it starts to get really interesting, though. In 2021, Democratic Assemblywoman Rochelle Nagayan, who recently just became the first Asian American in the Nevada Senate, introduced Assembly Bill 363. And let's be honest. This bill is 100% about protecting the hotel industry. The hotel simply didn't want 10,000 competitors out there taking rooms, families, and disposable income away from them. But instead, she introduced the bill to her constituency as a way to protect affordable housing near the Las Vegas Strip. Again, you gotta be pretty damn gullible to believe that line, but suffice to say, in an effort to protect our bread and butter, under the guise of protecting our residents from all these increasing real estate prices, Nevada passed Bill 363. So what did these politicians come up with? Well, they agreed to make short-term rentals legal under some of these following circumstances. Owners can operate by applying for a license. However, until your license is actually approved, you can't operate your rental unless you already had a license. A year later, no one has their license, by the way. Most importantly, you cannot operate a short-term rental if it's within 2,500 feet of a hotel resort. Gotcha. Then occupants have a 10 p.m. curfew for outdoor activities. So yeah, don't even think about swimming past 10 o'clock at night here in Vegas. No parties, weddings, or events allowed. Now here's the kicker. The bill states that officials can legally inspect the property with no advance notice, none. Even landlords have to provide their tenants with 24 hours notice, but yet the government can simply knock on your door and inspect anytime they want 
without notice. Well, as you can imagine, this really pissed people off. First, the government is telling you what you can and cannot do with your own property. And now the government has the right to enter your property anytime they want without probable cause. As a result, a woman named Jackie Flores founded the Greater Las Vegas Short-Term Rental Association, known simply as GLVSTRA. It just rolls right off the tip of the tongue, right? <laughs> All right, well, in August of last year, these patriots decided to challenge this bill and filed a suit that's currently pending in the Nevada Supreme Court. Well, in February, Judge Jessica Peterson filed an injunction against the county and declared this law unconstitutional. The judge stated that not only was the law vague, but that the prohibited gatherings clause can also include religious activities, which are protected by the Constitution. Additionally, that Gestapo era inspection without warning was amended to include a 48 hour notice. So where do things stand right now and why are short-term rentals dead? Well, there's a few moving parts. First, permits still have not been granted. Applicants had until August 21st to apply. It seems as though only about 20% of hosts even bother to apply. Remember, in order to apply, everyone that was illegally renting had to shut down for what's been about a year while they wait for a legal license. Meanwhile, illegal rentals have been fined between $1,000 and $10,000 per day, depending on the nature and severity of the violation. And the greatest kicker of all is that the government pressured sites such as Airbnb and VRBO into mandating every host upload their license prior to listing their property. As a result, it's virtually impossible to even run an illegal Airbnb since a host would have to do so completely privately and without the obvious marketing help that these host sites provide. Currently, these sites require a minimum 30 night stay, which just kills host's ability to cash in on big weekends and events. So while it's understandable that a state financially nourished by hotels and tourism decided to just eviscerate its competition, Many questions should and will be asked in the forthcoming months. Now, as an American, is it fair that the government can tell us what we can and cannot do with our own property? Can the government dictate who and for how long we allow people to occupy our property? I mean, we all agree in writing to abide by the rules of an HOA when we purchase that property. But is it fair to tell people who have already purchased their home what they can and cannot do with it after the fact? Now, from a macro perspective, the question I have is simply, what cities and counties are coming next? If Democrats continue to weaponize and vilify short-term rentals as the culprit for affordable housing, you'll see this quickly materialize in many of our favorite resort destinations. Now, as a consumer, some of us just don't wish to stay in a hotel. For large families especially, short-term rental properties can be the difference of being able to afford to even go on a vacation altogether. So it's not just about rich investors getting richer while raising home prices, but rather government overreach, corporate greed, and of course, politicians just lining their pockets. Well, that's it for this video, everyone. Please click to like and subscribe and share this video with all your friends and family. See you guys all in the next one. Deuces.